one. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett from uh, Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. We are honored to, with the presence of uh, Chandra D. Pujari, a well-known Indian neurosurgery educator, endoscopist, skull-based surgeon, based in Mumbai. Before we turn over, to, oh, let me let me let uh, I run from here. Go ahead, I take over. Thanks, John. Thanks, I. Thanks for the opportunity to share some uh, uh, case material and some ideas about uh, uh, I, I has been talking to you last uh, three or four days about uh, skull based approaches and taken you through a lot of difficult stuff, including the anterior petrosal approach uh, quite recently. And I thought I would show you the endoscopic perspective over the next few minutes. Uh, at any stage, uh, I, if you think we have had enough, just ask me to stop and we can continue another day. Okay. Um, so basically, as we have learned over the last few days, the basic principles of skull-based surgery remain the same, whichever uh, visualizing tool and instruments you use. It is basically understanding the anatomy using optimum imaging, surgical exposure, where you want a proper skull-based bone drilling, to make every surgery look like virtually a surface surgery, which also gives you an advantage of less brain retraction and use the natural corridors, extra dural approaches as you have seen, how the various uh, uh, dural layers can come to your help, not only in giving you a proper exposure, but saving important structures uh, while doing um, uh, the approach. And uh, initially we felt very strongly that the CSF drainage helps us uh, considerably and we have been very liberal with lumbar CSF drainage but lately we have started using it less and less for one important reason that uh, CSF actually forms a very good cushion and might actually prevent uh, damage to the vessels and nerves if you keep it intact so I think uh, it, it depends on your comfort it certainly gives you more space but it may be at the cost of uh, the fact that you may be able to do a little less manipulation if you have the CSF out of the system. And the most important thing, I think for any skull-based surgery, but more important for the endoscopic skull-based surgery, which is done through natural corridors, is the skull-based reconstruction. And I think this has been the biggest bugbear, why it did not progress as much as it did. Uh, it should have happened over the first uh, uh, decade or so and has now taken big leap because of the newer ways of skull-based reconstruction. So basically, we were talking about paramedian and some mid midline surgeries also yesterday and day before. And you have the standard outside approaches like basic frontal, lateral frontal, uh, which are the, uh, what should I say, the workhorse uh, uh, sort of approaches, interhemispheric and extended frontobasal, depending on how uh, far up you want to go and of course the terional and the variations like supraorbital and FTOZ depending on you belong to the minimally invasive or the maximally invasive uh, kind of uh, uh, philosophy. Basically, I think the endoscopic approaches have come to us from ENT surgeons and we must acknowledge them and the Schlofer's work in 1907 when he first described uh, inferior infracranial approach, as he said, to the pituitary is probably the landmark uh, uh, paper from where the inferior approaches were developed and over a period of time, endoscopy entered into it as we'll see in the next few uh, minutes. And these are the various approaches which initially developed to do that. Cushing of make it made uh, uh, a change in this. He certainly made it virtually completely endonasal without an external incision. But there was an incision uh, in the gingiva, uh, above sublabial incision as he called it, and uh, got through directly into the cella. And then when the question came of treating various lesions in the anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and up to the clivus, we had various extensions like many mini facial translocations and extended frontobasal translocations, etc. Marty Weiss was probably the first person who described that actually a endonasal approach itself could be converted into an extended approach and you could take a lot of tumors out uh, by this approach alone by using microscope. 
this is even before the days that endoscopy became popular in this area. And uh, uh, Fuldwell has actually written of this experience uh, of 105 cases which they did in, uh, I think, early 2000s. It's actually, I think, uh, the credit to use endoscopy for endonasal skull-based approaches should go to Ricardo Carao and uh, He Dong Cho, who started this at the Pittsburgh uh, uh, with their pituitary surgeries and the pure endoscopic surgery uh, could be done. We tried to follow this soon after because our ENT surgeon uh, got trained in it uh, very quickly. Uh, like many things happen, um, uh, Sethi learned from Karao and uh, Kirtane, one of my earlier colleagues, worked with Sethi. And uh, very soon, in 1996, we actually started doing this in India. However, uh, it became quite restricted because of the lack of proper instrumentation. And uh, therefore, we were restricted to use endoscope mainly as a supplement or endoscope-assisted surgery rather than endoscopic surgery alone. The way things have changed from 90s to now can be seen by this uh, web-based survey which uh, LAWS conducted recently which actually shows that almost 80% to 90% people all over the world are using endoscope today for endonasal skull-based surgery. And uh, this, this is uh, uniformly across the planet, for virtually in all countries, because endoscope is not so difficult to use. And uh, it may be used either as the only instrument or in addition to microscope. And people have started using it at several stages in the hospital. Uh, in the uh, uh, operation. Initially, there was a lot of debate as to should you be doing a transseptal approach, a middle turbinectomy was necessary, a paraseptal approach. And lately, most approaches have become two nostril forehand approaches, which can be called proper skull base approaches. Middle turbinectomy approach is pretty good to give you space initially when you are not so well trained and uh, where you are always struggling for space. However, Usually a paraseptal approach works, a transseptal approach or a middle turbinectomy approach becomes necessary only if you are going for an extensive skull base uh, procedure. So very simply, if you're doing a, a middle turbinate approach, you would usually cut the middle turbinate somewhere around uh, a four or five millimeters below its top to make sure that you don't fracture the skull base itself and do not damage any olfactory fibers. And once you have done that, you are usually seeing the uh, superior uh, turbinate and you are seeing the spinoid model races quite well. You can virtually get hold of the keel and you are uh, directly into the um, cella, as you can see here. So very, very straightforward approach. When you are doing it paraseptal, when you don't want to take off the, you, you need to, first of all, uh, use your... Uh, uh, solution which you use for decongesting the nose quite well. People use cocaine. Uh, we, we have actually used mainly a uh, combination of uh, xylocaine and adrenaline in a proper proportion. And uh, depending on the patient's condition, the anesthetist allow you a proper concentration. And then you localize the spinoid ostium, you open the anterior spinoidal wall, then the cellar wall, and then you go for the tumor like you will find here, you, you can make a very, very safe entry into this and you will find that you are entering, uh, you are seeing the uh, sphenoid model races and the opening into the sphenoid very easily as you go in. And you can see that uh, there is the, uh, there is usually a sphenoid model artery here, which we'll see in the next picture. And many a times you can damage it when you are trying to enlarge the opening. So be careful, especially these days when you want to preserve this to make your nasoceptal flap for repair. Once you've done this, usually you try going down first and then going on the other sides. Initially, we used punches liberally. Today, most of this work is done with the drills. One of the biggest advantages of the panoramic view of uh, endoscope is that when you have so many septae and when you are not sure where you are, even without uh, uh, the need for CM, here we did use CM, one of the early cases, but you can usually make out that uh, these are the septae and your, your cella is probably 
completely here. You can see that mainly because of the optic nerve prominence is here, optic nerve prominence is here, and what we call medial OCR, the optico carotid races, which gives you a very clear boundary as to your where you can go up and how far laterally you can go at the top. And once you have done that, you can open your cella in various ways. If you want to preserve the bone, and if the bone has remained intact, it is not infiltrated, you can make a flap of it, keep it down, and you, if you can do it this way, you can actually put it back when you are reconstructing the defect. Otherwise, usually it is taken off, and it can be re-put later on, or it is not actually necessary to put the bone back while reconstructing. When you are dealing with an asymmetric cella, when you have a... a Microadenoma on one side, then you can actually see enlargement of the one side of the uh, cella, as you can see in this particular uh, picture. And you can actually open only this side of the cella. If, like in this patient, the microadenoma is here, and you can keep the uh, other side completely intact to preserve the normal pituitary, like we have done in this case. We were very particular about doing such minimally invasive openings earlier, but more and more we find that it can be uh, difficult to do it. You may not be able to do a radical excision. So we prefer now to open the cella completely and then uh, repair it properly. But if, if you are very, very clear that you have adenoma in one half of the gland, you can tackle only that half of the gland. This is another microadenoma which has been taken out and you can see on the post-operative scan, the tumor has been taken out, rest of the gland remains normal and patient has improved hormonally. When you have a large tumor like this, in earlier days it used to be struggle because you are working through one nostril, you had suction uh, or you had curate and then we actually developed our own suction curate to remove this kind of a tumor and uh, you will find that uh, we developed several different kinds of curate. The most important thing you need to remember is that when you are shifting from microscopy to endoscopy, you have to change from bayonet uh, instruments to straight instruments curled only at the tip because you cannot use a bayonet instrument satisfactorily along the shaft of the endoscope and I think that is the main uh, difference and if you really want to do radical excisions if you want to go in supracellar region you need to have adequately uh, what shall I say uh, curved instruments and you can literally prepare your own instruments depending on the kind of curves you require. And even in the early period, we could remove large tumors like this fairly comfortably, even with irregular margins. Various things changed over a period of time. Kappa Bianca brought the endovision, irrigation, and lens cleaning system going along with this. Kassam advocated binostral approach, and we were quite influenced by uh, Kassam's approach uh, to begin with because it made it much easier for a neurosurgeon to have suction in one hand and instrument in another hand. And this bimanual uh, surgery is what we have learned uh, when we learned our microsurgery. And it not only gives us a good uh, manipulation, but it also gives us a very good idea about uh, uh, the depth. Uh, you know, the both hands usually work in tandem. So you get a good GPS where your left hand goes, the right hand usually goes there and it becomes much more easier to coordinate. And therefore, once we shift to an austral approach somewhere around 2006 or seven, we have stayed with by approach since then for the last uh, more than 700 cases now. Giorgio Frank worked with us for uh, uh, some cavernous sinus lesions uh, uh, a couple of times and uh, we have been quite... Uh, happy in tackling the cavernous sinus uh, tumor since then. And maybe I'll show you something uh, on that. So basically what we call a pituitary tumor uh, can actually, though it remains mainly within the realms of not being called a giant tumor, uh, you, you still have a tumor which has overflown the carotids on both the sides. You can see that the tumor has gone. It is virtually nos grid. 3B. You have tumor going uh, on both sides of the carotid. You are going. Uh, you have tumor going uh, right uh, from top to bottom, and you have a thin margin of the normal pituitary gland on one side, uh, which 
may or may not be seen during surgery. So first important thing is you do a carotid to carotid exposure. You make sure we use Doppler to make sure that you have gone from carotid to carotid. We insonate carotids on both the sides to make sure that you have opened that. And then we try to develop a plane between the cavernous sinus when we're dealing with a tumor going into the cavernous sinus because that usually gives you a good idea as to if you can develop a plane between the cavernous sinus and uh, uh, the tumor or not. And then you will remove tumor first from the bottom, then from the sides and go for the top of the tumor only towards the end because you do not want the diaphragm to come down very early and block your view. If that happens, then you really need to use one hand only to keep the diaphragm up. And you can see while removing the tumor from here, the arachnoid has become quite bare, but uh, part of the tumor lying there has been taken out. Part of the tumor going beyond the carotid has been taken out from there. And uh, it seems that uh, we are clear. And this is the post-operative scan, which actually shows that the normal pituitary lying on this side has become a little thicker and the whole tumor has come out and there is no tumor remaining, even the tumor going flowing over the carotid has been possible to uh, be taken out completely. And this patient remained hormonally completely intact. Further to this, I think if you want to remove bigger tumors, uh, and if you want to remove other tumors in the supracellular region, you need to use what is called extended uh, approaches. And initial uh, reports about extended approaches started coming around 2005 or so. And we uh, started doing that as about 2006. So I think biomanual dissection with two surgeon technique is absolutely essential for this. And my present colleague, Dr. Nishit Shah is extremely dedicated. And I'm fortunate to have uh, somebody like him who helps me through the whole uh, treatment. What we have realized is that if you want to do the extended or a proper skull based surgery, you need to use uh, uh, the navigation more often than what you would do for a usual pituitary surgery, you should have the insonating Doppler here, and you should have suctions and curates which are curved in various ways so that you can use it depending on the kind of angle which is afforded by uh, your exposure at that particular time. For most of this, the transmenoidal corridor remains the first corridor except for the uh, maybe cervical medullary junction or the clivus, lower clivus. Most other places, uh, except for frontal sinus uh, uh, area and uh, the uh, craniovertebral junction area, you, you need to first open the sphenoid and then extend your incision. Here, what you can see is a young man with a large tumor lying in the anterior cranial fossa and going uh, back and uh, front both the sides in both the directions and a normal gland lying at the back here. So this patient has undergone a figure of eight kind of a bone removal. You can see that the bone has been removed, not only from the cella, but in front of the anterior intercavernous sinus onto the plenum spinoidal here. And then we are ligating the uh, anterior intercavernous sinus by coagulating uh, with the spatial bipolars, which we have created. Uh, we find that uh, the current bipolars available are not very uh, good from various companies uh, because they make a to and fro movement while actually coagulating. Uh, so we have uh, managed to prepare our own. And as soon as you open this, you'll find uh, that the soft tumor starts coming down. And uh, we'll, we'll run through this uh, so that you can see the cellar part of the tumor has been taken out. And you can see now that you've gone into the supracellar region. You are on the undersurface of the optic nerves and chiasm here quite uh, Easily you can see and uh, the uh, anterior cerebral artery being opened. We want to have a better look with it. So you can either use a 30 degree or a 45 degree scope or you can uh, uh, open a little more where we thought that was better. The arachnoid strands are maintained. The uh, perforating vessels are maintained and you can continue like uh, what you would do in a, a proper skull based surgery. Uh, using patties to cover your important areas and save all the perforators and remove the whole tumor like it has been possible over here. And this is the post-operative picture. The man has not only improved completely in his uh, vision, but has maintained his hormonal status. To extend this further, you can do it for 
giant pituitaries, craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas, chondromas, chondrosarcomas, excessive neuroblastomas. And in India, uh, basilar invagination is fairly common. Occasionally, if it doesn't reduce completely with a posterior approach, odontectomy may be required in some patients. So this is another young girl, 13 year old, with a prolactinoma which was resistant to uh, the hormonal treatment. She first improved and then she became resistant and then we were forced to do a surgery. So you can see even in a 10 year old, it is possible not only to go in, but to get a good approach uh, right up to the planum and then continue to remove the tumor. You can start seeing the normal pituitary. The biggest advantage I find of using endoscope is that I have done about 100 uh, microscopic pituitary tumors before that. The identification of the normal gland was not so easy. Here you can see virtually that you are seeing the normal gland, the orange colored gland, which has a very, very regular lining. And you can see the difference between the tumor and the normal gland quite well. Now I'm going into the supracellar region, trying to remove this tumor and uh, now we have entered actually the third ventricular component, as you can see, removing it from the... Now, one important thing is, yes, there is some bleeding. And if you can use your suction and uh, uh, you can use two suction technique, your vision is much better. Even if you, you need to use a uh, curate on one hand, try to use your suction properly in the other hand. And the proper use of curved suction is extremely important to take this last bit of tumor out from foron of Monroe, as you can see, ah, sorry. I think that was from aqueduct and further you will see that the foron of Monroe has also become free. So virtually the whole intraventricular component can be taken out without damaging the ventricular wall at all. And this is the post-operative picture. Of course, this girl uh, required further medical treatment, but uh, she, she had immediate relief from her visual problems and it became much easier to control her disease. When you go transtuberculum, like you need to go for a Rathke's cleft cyst like this, you, you need to open, again, uh, thin out the planum, remove the tuberculum completely, and then you go for the lesion. What is most important while removing such a cyst is make sure that you do not damage the, uh, uh, what, what do you call, the pituitary stalk. The pituitary stalk is just lying just before, below this, as you will see in a moment. And uh, you are removing the tumor bit by bit. And all the time you are taking care that uh, you, you can see the stock at the back now here. I'm sorry, the picture is a little dark uh, on my screen today. Uh, but you, you can see that the whole cyst wall has come out and uh, the stock is intact and all the rest of the anatomy is well preserved. Maybe you can see it better now. This is the post-operative picture. You can see a complete excision over here. And... Uh, Meningiomas remain controversial, but of course there is something which is just flowing onto the uh, planum and where the size is not too big, there is no calcification, there is no hyperostosis and the optic nerve canal, as you can see here, is infiltrated only actually medially. And this is an ideal case, therefore, that we can take this out by, so first make a hadath flap. Uh, that is something we'll talk about later. Once you have made the hadath flap, you open the planum and then I'm using actually PUSA to remove this tumor and going all around it, cutting the uh, dural attachment. And once I have done that, I need to manipulate the tumor further. So uh, the tumor is being dissected now from the pituitary gland. And then we've decided to take this tumor out and then maybe uh, take the optic canal component out later on. So debulking this, further attempt at debulking this. Eventually I have decided to open the optic canal further. And once I have done that, you can see that I'm going all along the optic nerve and getting the tumor out completely from the canal uh, itself. And this is the post-operative scan which shows a good uh, excision. This lady has remained recurrence-free about five years now uh, and no evidence of tumor.
Laligam Shekhar has come out with a scoring system now which tumor should be operated transcranially, which tumors can be operated trans uh, sphenoidally. But basically, I think you need a, at least a 12 millimeter distance between the two carotid arteries. The dural tail should not be too long and hyperostosis should not be uh, a major issue. Craniopharyngiomas, I think, is the best indication today because of their line of uh, uh, growth. Most of them grow along the uh, uh, infundibulum, and this is a trans infundibular kind of craniopharyngioma, and ideally uh, sort of uh, located for a uh, transphenoidal approach. And here we are opening up the planum again, and you can see that uh, the calcium is being taken out. Uh, the calcified component is stuck to the uh, stalk and it has been a struggle to remove this, but eventually we have managed to remove this tumor from completely inside of the third ventricle and managed to keep the stalk intact, at least uh, uh, structurally. Functionally, how it will progress, we have to wait and see. And this patient I have operated about four years ago. She required DDAVP for about eight months. And currently, she does not require any DDAVP and there is no tumor recurrence, no further treatment. And she remains well. One of the major things which you have found is that the obesity which is accompanying uh, these children after radical excision is not usually seen. A larger tumor may require a multi-pronged approach. We needed uh, to open the, actually the clivus in this patient and then uh, get the pituitary slightly in front like we have seen here and then remove it through the interpeduncular fossa. Uh, I think I won't take the whole video, but this is how it has been taken out from behind the pituitary and it has been possible to excise this tumor completely with virtually a normal looking scan. It's about seven years now. Uh, I, do you think I should continue or leave it for another day? Um, Chandra, let me just say we have China Neurosurgery Grand Rounds in about uh, 20 minutes, so. Uh, so I just, think we leave rest of the time for maybe discussion. Yes. And, uh, well, we, we can come back another day to do the clivus and uh, maybe uh, some other uh, assisted procedures. Yes, that's a good idea, I think. John, yes. John, Yes. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, John, uh, the way it is done should be that uh, we should we should probably go down uh, on endoscopic approaches for probably the next three or four days, and uh, that would bring the momentum up. So instead of uh, going ahead with something else, if Chandra is free, so that we can go ahead and uh, deal with each and everything. So he was talking about the headed flap today. Okay. He showed some videos today. He showed the anatomy today. He was talking about some tips and tricks today. So okay. all this for the next three or four days or even a full week, if we can go ahead and uh, do it, that'll be the best. That would be great. If Chandra can do it, we can do it. No, I, I think uh, uh, it's, it's quite enjoyable. We could do the clivus and the coronal plane maybe. Uh, uh, are, we, are we doing something tomorrow or it's Monday to Saturday? Uh, oh. uh, no, every day, every day. So we could do that. I think uh, tomorrow day after should be okay with me. We can do that uh, for the next couple of days and uh, do the skull base. Yeah. And then maybe do the brain and ventricles uh, for two more days. That's, that's Done. Uh, okay, at, great. Least, at least three more uh, uh, sessions, I think uh, it would require if we want to do a comprehensive uh, yeah, this is what we want, actually. I mean, we would want a really comprehensive stuff. So at the end of it, one day we can talk about the tips and tricks, uh, extension of these approaches and things like that, and probably the future. That um, I will also uh, participate into that. We can participate and maybe show some cases also, which, which we can yes. discuss. Yeah. Oh, that was yes, great. absolutely. So, uh, and after that, I'll go ahead and uh, look, after, look up anterolateral approaches again with terms of uh, uh, basilar aneurysms and some other aneurysms uh, we will look up mm -hmm. and then some few cases. And then um, uh, Luis Borba wants to join in. So I'll tell Luis as well, so I will give him his time so that we can all, uh, me, Chandra, uh, Albert also wants to join in. So we can all be panelists while 
um, Louis, Professor Goyle wants to join in, so let uh, him also um, uh, do some do some cases, and that we will all be, join in, yeah. and then we slowly build this up. Okay, we have twenty minutes right, for discussion. And child okay, so anybody wants to ask a question or something, then um, let's let them go ahead. For me, I'll. Uh, I, I mean, excellent work, and I have been seeing that he started uh, doing this uh, surgery from 1996, uh, which means the time uh, when I was a pre-med medical student. So uh, that's a long time. That's a huge experience. So, um, well, I mean, it's been learning along the way, as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, I've been, you know, I've been pretty, pretty obstinate about uh, craniopharyngioma being done through the anterolateral skull base till about a few years back uh, when Roman Bojniak uh, from the Institute of uh, Dolink, he was the first person who asked me to try endoscopic and then we picked it up. We did a lot of dissections with Vinod Felix and uh, then after that we started doing the uh, extended uh, endoscopy and stuff like that. So. Uh, then we understood that it was stupid, stupid of me to uh, think and fight with uh, the endoscopic guys saying that I could take out any craniopharyngioma. So in fact, I uh, just to prove a point, I even published um, craniopharyngioma in Narayan's uh, textbook chapter saying that this is how we take out uh, cranios from the anterolateral approach. But uh, I think that is a lot of effort and uh, that is uh, probably not worth it. Uh, with the endoscopy. I mean, we, when we started operating endoscopically, we understood it's a much, much better choice than uh, anterolateral. Of course, you can always catch the nose this way, but then um, we should always prefer to catch the nose uh, the right way, you see. So uh, other than that, w w I mean, few things that he told I would like to reiterate. One is use of bayoneted instruments with uh, microscopy. So, I mean, with the uh, endoscopy. Uh, this is a stupid thing to do. So uh, with the endoscopy, you always need straight instruments which are curved at the end, uh, very, very elegantly put there. So this is something that a lot of people don't realize. That's one thing which is very, very important. For me, I personally like uh, things at very high magnification. So I always wish whether I could increase the magnification. I can do that with my stores, but it's uh, digital magnification. I always uh, wish whether I can do an endoscopic optical magnification and be near, very near the, the stuff that I'm operating with. And uh, another thing I always uh, tend to do is uh, water irrigation, a lot of irrigation during my surgeries. And um, also, uh, I would like to see some of his uh, instruments which he's using, like the suction curette, uh, we use a monopolar suction, which uh, sometimes earlier days I used to uh, put an IV sheath over the... Right. The no, I think the, uh, that is very good for the nasal and maybe even the uh, initial part of the procedure. But once you are inside the cella, then you uh, turn... In fact, uh, the ENT guys now got this coblator, which actually transmits the bipolar current. So you can probably still use something like that, but uh, I think we are more happy using our own instruments, which are, uh, you know, bi tip uh, uh, bipolars. Yeah, so the coblator is something that we are, there is an Indian company, Coopers, who makes by, I mean, uh, coblators, and then we are working with them to, uh, for the sports surgery as well. So we make different tips, uh, shaving ticks for coblators. We're trying to make a shaving tip for coblator because it apparently takes only one cell layer. We have worked with the bones coblator as well. And, uh, you know, debrider is another big uh, plus. In fact, um, we have used the debrider in some strange places. I'll be happy to show these cases uh, sometime. So, um, well, Yes, we have huge uh, experience of Professor Dupujari with us. So for the next three days, let's enjoy it and let's learn from him. Okay, Gautam has a, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Gautam has a question. Go ahead, Gautam. Hello, sir, yes, this yes, is Dr. Please. Gautam. I'm from uh, Chennai. Probably you would be knowing me. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I uh, 
can you, is it possible for you to show any images of the uh, instruments so that uh, uh -huh. we can get a clean place because I, I have I, i'll show it to you on monday yes yes yeah, yeah. because i have just now started endoscopic work probably four cases of transpinoidal i have done on my own Mm -hmm. uh like you said uh, initially uh, previously i used to do with microscope but now i changed to endoscope and as you said uh, previous uh, in the starting one or two cases i was uh, using the bayonet bayonet uh, instrument so now i have changed back to the straight instruments and uh, but i am doing more uh, on a uh, from a single uh, nostril and uh, with a two hand technique uh with a, a very difficulty Uh, so i would like to see some instruments like because i am having difficulty in uh, elevating the flaps uh, uh, especially some instruments so it will be a great uh, help certainly i'll i'll let you know uh, uh, show you some instrument but but it's it's fairly simple i i think what you need is you need graduated suctions you need them at uh, various uh, uh, bends and uh, i think one of the most important things which is lacking uh, in uh, the international instrument sets right now is a good pair of bipolar yes and i think that is that is something which uh, we are hoping that uh, <laughs> our uh, bipolars uh, uh, will get a little finer and uh, will be probably approved by any international company for but they are available in market in india oh okay okay thank you very much <laughs> Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you, Professor Chandra, for the class, and uh, thank you, guys, for coming. So, John, uh, will you put up an edited version of this uh, on the Neurosurgical Coach page, please? Yes, of course. Yeah. So, um, then uh, after that, we will see. So, tomorrow again, Chandra will be continuing. Tomorrow, that yeah. is Sunday. Monday as well, uh, he will be continuing. And if he wants to do one more, then he is very welcome. and after that let me see if a uh, uh, few of the other guys would want to come now two of the young neurosurgeons uh, that is uh, andrea and uh, edmundo they would like to do mcqs maybe kalit abdi fata he can also start doing mcqs we can start discussing these mcqs they apparently these boys are very interested with these questions and discussions mm. so we can start doing that as well and uh, two or three questions yeah I, we have a couple of questions here can we can we address yeah. them please yes please okay khalif go ahead khalif go ahead khalif yeah yeah i i just wanted to ask uh, prof the the mobility associated with these extended and nasal approaches how we handle um, csf leaks but so, that will be discussed like I, when he's when he's discussing the 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 reconstructions and then yeah. anosmia how common is anosmia in these patients right so basically you know the last part of the talk relates to the complications at the the nasal as well as uh, the rest of the stuff but uh, yeah. to tell you in very brief i think it is true that the nasal morbidity is uh, definitely high mainly because of extensive removal of mucosa that you get a uh, lot of sinusy formations and therefore repeated sinusitis etc uh bridge of the nose can become a problem especially in young patients so i think there are a few things and this is where uh, having a good ent colleague helps number one is that uh, we have actually done nasoceptal flap now in a infant four months we actually recently published four cases done in infancy uh, with nasoceptal flap uh, in child's nervous system and you can have a look at that the most important thing is not to get uh, 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 it right up to the bridge of the nose the second important thing is whenever you make a hadath flap you should make a reverse flap from the opposite side to cover the exposed part of the uh, nasal septum so that you do not get crusting over there and the third okay. most important part is that 5 days after surgery whenever you have had extensive mucosal dissection like an extended procedure you usually take this patient under anesthesia for a nasal cleaning and for their first uh, proper uh, examination to make sure that your flap is right and there are no sinusy formations and they follow this up at least for two more weeks we call patients back for a endoscopic opd examination and uh, usually that suffices but one in 10 patients still needs more than three uh, cleanings 
and one or two patients have actually required a repeat procedure just to get the sometimes uh, when you have a septal perforation uh, you you may even have to put a splint to make sure that your flaps stick properly and then you need to remove that after okay. about uh, 6 weeks or so so i think this requires a little more ent expertise and not directly under our control and therefore i think that has reduced the uh, nasal morbidity quite a lot in normal pituitary surgery i think uh, removing less mucosa is probably better today than what was earlier prescribed because you really need to restrict yourself to uh, the cella and as long as you can see the cellar margins quite well you need not actually disturb rest of the mucosa thank you thank you Barbara. okay and regarding the MCQs, I'll be I'll be willing to at least uh, maybe two or three questions after every presentation to to just discuss. yeah from yeah, one day. We will, what we will do is we will have a day just for questions and discussion. So let uh, okay. uh, Andrea, Edmundo, and you you can prepare these questions and then we can go ahead and discuss them and then um, we will have the masters also around so that we can. Uh, if we know the answer to these MCQs, I don't, I don't know whether we will pass these exams these days. I really don't think so. But uh, I'm, I'm fortunate I <laughs> live in the That's going to chuckle but, from the bell. <laughs> yeah, so but uh, anyways, I'm, I'll be happy to discuss them from the outside. It's like, you know, football analysis, uh, not on the pitch, but, uh, you know, analyzing from outside cricket or football that is uh, much pleasant than uh, playing it you know so i mean i would any day exactly. be willing to operate on an activism and answer these mcq questions so um, i'm sure dr dipujari will agree to that so but we will help you we will try and see if uh, we can help with these questions if it's possible we'll be able to give our inputs so let's see yeah. how it is um, thank you very much guys thank you sir yeah, thank you for thank you for today then. Yeah, I we have one more question. Do you want to take it? I or okay. Maybe Dr. Dr. Professor Professor Dupujari. I mean yeah. uh, Chandra can take Go it. Go ahead. Okay, Dr. Bidio Pujari. Sheena Ali asks, what would you consider the biggest advantage of microscopic resection over endoscopic? Uh, <laughs> well, I think uh, uh, today my uh, main consideration for doing a microscopic procedure, I, I think what we are discussing is an endoscopic endonasal procedure versus an open microsurgical craniotomy. And if we are discussing that, then my two biggest indication, and maybe I'll start my talk with that tomorrow, is that if you have a bigger paracellar extension, like in a meningioma, if you have extension into the lateral part of the optic canal or lateral to the carotid, I would not uh, like to go uh, medially or certainly not as the only procedure. It could be one of the two stage procedures. Occasionally we have had tumors which have infiltration of the skull base as well as the tumors are going laterally. And there now we are doing a bi portal approach <coughs> either simultaneously, but more commonly we are doing it in staged approach. So I think today a paracellar extension is my main indication for a microscopic approach. I do not think the size itself matters. Very good, thank you, Doctor. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow and we appreciate Dr. Chandra coming out to, uh, today. And uh, we invite you to come to China, Neurosurgery Grand Rounds, but it's in Chinese. So I don't know, oh. <laughs> uh, shortly. So, uh, mm. okay, we'll see everyone tomorrow. See you Thanks. tomorrow, John. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.